Dr. John Lee is a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute in America and formerly a senior fellow at the United States Study Centre at the University of Sydney. From 2016 to 2018, he was senior national security advisor to the then Australian Foreign Minister, Julie Bishop. He has held adjunct professorships at the Australian National University and the University of Sydney. He is one of the foremost experts on the Chinese political economy and on strategic and economic affairs pertaining to the Indo-Pacific. His articles have been published in leading policy and academic journals in the United States, throughout Asia and here in Australia. He received his master's and doctorates in international relations from the University of Oxford. John, thank you so much for your time. I have admired your writings for a very long time. And I think the last two or three years of those writings ought to be compulsory for every single Australian, including our school children and our university students. But having said that, uh, thank you indeed for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me, John. Can I begin? Uh, it's rightly, uh, I think, often pointed out that the Communist Party of China is not China. You. China itself is not the Chinese people. There's a sharp distinction that ought to be drawn. And as a keen historian, it strikes me that one of the things that should never be forgotten is that whilst the Chinese Communist Party seeks to speak for China uh, in an extraordinary way, in reality, their activities during the Second World War, particularly, and in the build up to the communist uh, takeover in 1948, were pretty profoundly ugly for the Chinese people that they now seek to say that they champion. Well, if you look, going back to that war period, if you look at the destruction and chaos for the Chinese people, it was largely due to an ongoing civil war. It, it wasn't so much due to outside powers. Now, outside powers, particularly the Japanese, did create quite a bit of destruction in some parts of China. But the most traumatic events from World War II onward have been perpetrated by the Chinese Communist Party. And of course, after World War II, uh, you had the Mao Zedong period where tens of millions of Chinese people died. But what the Chinese Communist Party has done really well, and we haven't really begun to contest that until very recently, and it may be too late, what they've done really well is define Chineseness and to conflate Chineseness with the Chinese Communist Party. So these days, now when you criticize China, the nation, or the Chinese Communist Party, they will often say you're insulting 1.4 billion Chinese people. We tend to let them get away with that. And, and that's a huge concession because once you let them get away with that, it actually means that you have no comeback when they um, advance further their narrative of grievance uh, in, in terms of outside powers, humiliating them and, and devastating them. Uh, so, you know, we, we, it's very hard to go backwards now, but we really did concede too much. It's the CCP uh, that wrecked the destruction on China uh, that meant that the People's Republic of China was backward and impoverished for as long as it was. Um, and, and, you know, we need to remember that part of history before even thinking about um, the role of the CCP moving forward. It seems to me to be very important because... The, uh, it, it does seem to me that Beijing plays up this idea that the rest of the world sort of almost has to pay us back for the terrible way that we were treated, we were humiliated. Now, there's a great element of truth in that, John. I mean, the way the four powers behaved in the 19th century in China was disgraceful. Um, you could say there's another terrible thing that the West has visited on China, communism itself. Karl Marx, if you like, would have seen himself as a child of the Enlightenment. Now, there's a provocative statement, but I think he would have. On the other hand, China has been an unbelievable beneficiary of the rules-based order, the very rules-based order that it now seeks to break up uh, and um, that has, has, has produced so much prosperity for it. One wonders how much more they want. Xi Jinping likes to take us back to the Mao Zedong period. And we have to remember that the Mao Zedong period uh, or the post Mao Zedong period is a ha, there's been more time under the post Mao Zedong period than Mao Zedong period, and, and the point I'm trying to make is that since uh, the 1980s, 
the world has helped China to rise. Uh, you know, the world has assisted China to become the second largest economy in the world and, and, and the largest manufacturing economy in the world. So, so the question is, how far do you go back in history? Um, you know, I, I often make the joke with, you know, when I have these debates with um, some Chinese colleagues that, you know, sh- should, the, should Italy, modern day Italy, go back to the Roman Empire to make the claims that they do? You know, should the, uh, uh, sh- should the Vietnamese go back a thousand years when, when they were ascendant in their, their period of time? The point I'm trying to make is you've got to look at the period since the 1980s. China has essentially been allowed and helped and assisted to be the country that it is. For the Chinese to actually say to the world that the West in particular have suppressed it and kept it down, it just doesn't accord with reality. Now, of course, ideology um, is, doesn't have to accord with reality, and the Chinese Communist Party has used that particularly well to sell its victim narrative to its own people. It obviously controls the textbooks and the curriculums and the schools and universities in Beijing, uh, in, in China. Uh, so this is a very difficult problem to solve because that is the history they're given. Uh, and of course, it's very self-serving for the Chinese Communist Party. Yeah, well, we'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. Um, but to come back to the issue at hand, I mean, the world is horrified at what's happening in Ukraine, rightly so. But we can't focus, in my view, enough on the issue of Chinese and Russian relationships and what it means uh, for the global uh, rules-based order. Um, This great rapprochement, it's all the way (laughs) with our friends from both Beijing and from Moscow. Um, It seems, just before we go into that, what has been the history of the relationship between China and, and Russia since, since Mao succeeded in 1948. It seems to have been quite turbulent. And most of the time, they don't seem to have had very much in common. Well, of, of course, with the, with the uh, Nixon years, uh, when the Americans and the Chinese, in a sense, um, had a um, tactical uh, partnership against the Soviet Union, um, since then, the Chinese and the Soviet Union, or then the Soviet Union, had a particularly hostile relationship. But I think the relevant period is really from the 1990s um, in terms of of what's relevant today. Um, If you look at the 1990s, which is clearly an extremely pivotal time for both Russia and China, Russia was liberalising to some extent, economically and politically, under Boris Yeltsin. Uh, In contrast, China had gone through the Tiananmen massacre in 1989, And it's often called the Tiananmen Square protest or massacre, but we have to remember this was a series of protests in around 400 Chinese cities. It was a countrywide protest and the CCP came very close to losing power. So from that sort of traumatic political event for the CCP in 1989, they spent the next few years trying to work out what it was they had to do to remain in power. And this is where uh, Russia comes in. Now, Russia... Russia became more liberal politically, uh, but it was still an oligarchy. Uh, But China looked at the Russian experience and it learnt very different lessons to what we learnt. Uh, The Chinese Communist Party uh, in Russia, uh, sorry, the Chinese Communist Party as far as Russia concerned, the communists in Russia lost power not because they were too authoritarian, uh, but because they tried to be too liberal. Uh, So the period of vulnerability as far as the CCP is concerned uh, is not when you seek to partially liberalise. It's when you. Oh, oh, it's not when you seek. It's not when you're too authoritarian. It's when you seek to partially liberalise. So for the CCP, they to this day mock Gorbachev for being a disaster and a fool. You know, they say that Gorbachev was the one who, through his openness, perestroika, and glasnost, he was one who precipitated the fall of the communists in Russia. Now, another lesson the CCP learned from the uh, Russian experience in the 1990s was that the Chinese Communist Party has to maintain central economic and social relevance. That is, they must be the primary dispensers of economic and social opportunity to the rising middle classes in the country. If they don't do that, they'll become irrelevant and they'll lose power. Uh, And the final lesson that uh, Beijing learned in the 1990s from the Russian experience is that if 
you get too close to the United States and the West, it is inherently dangerous because these democracies cannot help themselves but uh, but but seek to uh, precipitate the fall of authoritarian governments. So China realized as far back as the 1990s, and the documents show that, um, that they need America and they need the West, but the struggle against democracy and the West goes on. Now back to Russia, uh, this is all relevant today because China hasn't really changed over all these years. So in the 1990s, it saw Russia as a model of what not to do. Um, in fact, they were rather disdainful of the Russians. But that all changed when Vla Vladimir Putin came into power. Um, there is still a deep distrust between the Russians and the, and, and, and the Chinese. But they have a common enemy, which is America and the West. And in this sense, they are ideological and political uh, bedfellows. Now, a final thought, um, what really binds Russia and China, China under Putin and Xi, it's not that they're communists, it's that they're both devout followers of Leninism uh, and that the West is its enemy. Those are the two aspects that bind them. And this is why I expect uh, the China and Russia relationship to, to go on despite the differences between them. Uh, well, you've written that notwithstanding all of that, that China has made a big strategic blunder. I think uh, I'm quoting you accurately there. In aligning so closely with Russia in, in this unprovoked war against Ukraine, I mean, it could get worse than that. They might actually start to support them. They appear to be doing that already with trade. But how do you see this as playing out for China? Can you elaborate a little on why you, you've, you've written it's a blunder? Well, I guess if you consider um, what the Russian invasion of Ukraine has done and why it's negative for China, let me give you two or three reasons. First of all, by declaring this No Limits partnership, um, Xi has shown his cards as to where he thinks China's future lies, and that is with authoritarian Russia. It has fueled a narrative, and it's a correct one in my view, uh, that there is a alliance of authoritarian states, and they are on the march. And it has convinced a lot of the advanced democracies that this alliance of authoritarian states needs to be deterred or even defeated. Now, this has given a new energy not just to NATO, which has been a disaster for Russia, but also American allies in Asia, namely Japan, uh, Australia, and even the South Koreans and the Taiwanese and even the Singaporeans are now being more activated than they were before the Russian invasion. Now, another thing that has happened is... You know, we often heard Russia and China talk about the desire to um, institute a sphere of influence around them. And often this was just seen as a very abstract thing, you know, a sphere of influence, sure, they just want um, a, a bigger say in what goes on around them. We now know what an authoritarian sphere of influence looks like. It's not just that you exist peacefully around Russia and China. It is that Beijing and Moscow have a direct say and even veto in your domestic and foreign policies. That is what an authoritarian sphere of influence wants or means. And, and what that means is this has now activated more countries to um, find ways of seeking to resist that or prevent that from happening. We now know that Europeans are even now more likely to support some restrictions on exporting technology to China. And once again, that comes from the narrative uh, which has now emerged that the authoritarian countries are effectively becoming a, a group against us. Uh, one Another thing that has occurred which is not great for China, uh, Ukraine has shown that Russia is not an all-powerful military force. There are gaps in its military power. And that same sort of analysis can be applied to the People's Liberation Army uh, of, of China's. That, yes, we should uh, take the PLA seriously, but they are not an irresistible force, that they still have a lot of gaps to overcome. Uh, and, and, and there are ways, therefore, that we can deter or even defeat them should it actually come to a war. The, the final observation I'd make is, uh, you look what happened in the United Nations General Assembly, which is not an institution which is particularly friendly to the West, but you had around 140 nations condemning the Russian invasion uh, of Ukraine, you only had five supporting Russia and you had about 30 or so abstaining, including China. The point I'm making is that, you know, much of the world, not just the West, much of the world has turned against this sort of uh, militaristic uh, 
imposition of spheres of influence because they can see it uh, being uh, impacting on, on them directly these days. So this has been a very negative development for China. The Chinese, it strikes me, must have been a bit stunned at the incompetence of their Russian friends. Is that likely to make them back off? I mean, I would have thought they would have been really, frankly, very surprised by uh, the, the way the Russian armies performed. They would have been very surprised by, the, and I, I'm surprised, at the effectiveness of NATO and pulling itself together under Biden's leadership, as I look at it. And I would have thought another thing that you've written about is that it been a bit, I'd imagine, a bit disconcerted to discover, in fact, the Americans this time knew what the Russians were up to. It was plain their intelligence was very good and it was a very clever tactic to start to, in a wise way, inform the rest of the world what they were doing. Those three factors would surely give China pause to stop and think we better take a little more time to work these things through? Yeah, I, I, I had a conversation about this with um, a few Americans in the administration. Obviously, it was, wasn't a classified conversation, just a, a casual but close conversation. And the general consensus was that um, what's happening in Ukraine might have bought us, you know, perhaps five years on Taiwan. For some of the reasons you mentioned, the first reason is, uh, and you're correct to say, Beijing has been quite stunned at the extent of the um, um, cooperation between Europe and America on sanctions against Russia. The calculation very clearly before the invasion was that Europe and America would be divided and America would slap a few sanctions on, but it wouldn't really be um, a, a game-changing sanctions. The Chinese now realise that if there's any kind of war, for example, over Taiwan, the high likelihood is that the Americans would get a global cooperation to start imposing extremely harsh, particularly financial sanctions on the Chinese, and that would devastate the Chinese economy. So that's the first point. The second point is that, um, yes, there certainly has been surprise as to how badly the Russian military has performed. But part of the reason is that, you know, when you fight a war across more than two domains, so the domains of war are land, sea, air, cyber, space, any war in, involving more than two or more domains is really complicated. Um, and only the Americans tend to do it that well. If you look at the Chinese and the Russians over the last 20 years, and you look at their military budgets, they're impressive in terms of the numbers, in terms of the weapons they produce, but they haven't actually invested a lot in logistics and or, organization. Um, and, and, and so this will have given the a Chinese Communist Party and the People's Liberation Army pause uh, for thought because they haven't invested, as with the Russians, they haven't invested in logistics and coordination across different domains as, as well as the Americans have. So it's great to have all these powerful weapons, but if you can't actually use them in a field of battle in a coordinated way, then we see what happens. That's, that's, the, that's the, uh, a further reason. The final reason is that... Um, you know, unlike Russia, China still what seeks to be known as a legitimate or respected leader. You know, Putin plays a rather brutal, blunt game. It's really just a coerce through energy and military. But China wants to be seen as the leader in our region. It wants to change the norms and the standards in the region. You can't do that just by material power alone. So by now aligning with such an unpopular country and leader like Russia and Putin, uh, that has set the Chinese plan backwards. You know, China can't just start bombing Taiwan. That won't achieve its aims. It has to take Taiwan and it has to get other countries to accept its um, ownership over Taiwan and its leadership more broadly. So the Chinese now will be thinking, how do we do that? And, and, and so the silver lining, if there is one from our part of the world, it certainly has set back China's plans, and, and I think we bought ourselves some time. Interesting, because I think you and I would both say that time should not be wasted, and there are great forces in Australia that seem to want to fiddle forever. But to go back to one of your quotes, you've left us in no doubt, though, that in your view, uh, Xi does seek to take Taiwan. His objective is to unravel a strategic order in Asia that was created after the Second World War. Uh, and that he will, if necessary, use force 
uh, to achieve these aims. I take it that you're saying we've bought a little time, we'd be very unwise to waste it. We, we would. Um, if, if you look at, for example, our military um, pr procurement, um, you know, a lot have been made of AUKUS, and I, I've been a very strong supporter of AUKUS. But AUKUS is mainly associated with nuclear submarines, which don't really come online for 10, 15 years. You know, we may not have 10, 15 years. Um, what we need to do, besides in addition to nuclear submarines, we need to invest in the sorts of things that will deter China over the next five years. So here I'm talking about so-called asymmetrical weapons, such as uh, land-based missiles, hypersonic missiles. Um, we need to invest in offensive cyber, which Australia is doing. We need to invest in unmanned vehicles and drones, which is and build those for Australia needs to do. We need to think about, you know, where to position our forces outside Australia in, in coordination with the Americans and Japanese and so on. So those sorts of things we need to do over the next five years. So yes, we might have bought ourselves some time, but we still need to do them. On the economic front, um, the COVID-19 pandemic began a process of diversification away from China. That now needs to be accelerated. Um, you know, we now need to factor in the real political risk um, of, of being so reliant on China. I mean, I, I speak these days to a lot of business executives who sort of understand the world's change, but I don't think they still understand the extent to which the world has changed. So I say to them, for example, um, there is an ever-increasing chance of a conflict in Taiwan or somewhere else with China. And if there is a conflict, regardless of the result, you will not be sending boatloads of iron ore to China during the war or after the war. You know, everything changes. So what I'm really trying to say is um, we need to prepare ourselves uh, for a world where we are, we are not so reliant on China that it would devastate our economy if something terrible like this were to occur. I couldn't agree more. One of the things that concerns me is that I think another sign of our tardiness in Australia has been that since the beginning of COVID, we've talked supply chain, supply chain, supply chain security uh, and done little about it. And I remain to be convinced, for example, that we would have the energy reserves to keep anything going for long if, if trouble hit. Um, I, I, I am really concerned that the, at the lack of focus uh, and, and, and urgency that applies in far too much of the defence machinery and the bureaucratic planning in this country. We only have 13 Australian flagged ships, for example. That's all. Four of them are obsolete. They're about to be paid off. They're gas ships. We have no bulk tankers, uh, no tankers and no bulk carriers. And uh, as one um, very astute observer said to me the other day, running a defence policy uh, without a merchant marine is like trying to um, uh, run a Formula One car without wheels. What do you think? You've been a very astute observer for a long time of the Australian psych, the Australian political scene. What's missing in the equation when it comes to the necessary urgency across the nation? We're a democracy. It has to be ground-driven. We've got an election coming up. It's there. But there are a lot of people talking as though, well, we, we don't need to recognise that the next few years are urgent. I don't get it. Do you have any observations? I, I am just old enough to remember the 1980s. And, you know, most, I, I, I'm in my mid-40s, but if you're younger than that, we haven't lived through a real recession. I don't really count the COVID recession. We haven't lived through a real recession for about 30 years. Um, we, you know, we have all these debates about energy security or, or fiscal responsibility, all those sorts of things, but everything seems to keep on going as normal. So nothing really changes. So you have this attitude, both in the political class, but also amongst voters, that it doesn't really matter what you do. Everything's sort of going to be okay. You know, we, we haven't experienced uh, war for, for decades, at least not. not we, we sent troops to far off places like Afghanistan. We haven't really experienced war that has affected the homeland in any way. Um, the point I'm trying to make is I don't wish it on our country, but we haven't experienced any kind of material hardship over over at least three decades and, and that creates a certain kind of complacency which is very difficult to overcome 
just on the issue of energy itself, you know, we um, the debates that we have in Australia about energy mix, climate change. I mean, we could have found ourselves in a situation like Germany found themselves, where Germany closed down their nuclear power plants, or they phased them out. They dramatically de- uh, closed down their domestic sources of fossil fuels. But what 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 do they do in return? They basically import gas and oil from Russia, putting yes. them in an extremely vulnerable position. Um, they run the myth that they are a renewables country, when all it really means is they're reliant on uh, imports from other countries. So fossil fuels, they just don't really do anything themselves. Um, they make a show and dance of... of um, being good climate citizens in terms of the renewable statistics or whatever the case may be. The point I'm trying to make is that when reality hits, which Germany is finding now, you know, they're now trying to diversify their sources. They know the solution for them isn't more renewables. It's to find more gas from somewhere else. So, you know, it's only until uh, hardship and God forbid disaster hits that I think you populations and governments tend to take a a real hard proper look at what they really do to secure themselves uh so right now australia is still at the phase where we are having you know somewhat unreal discussions about our climate change targets and renewable targets and all those sorts of things uh there's no real reference to what it is we need in our future and what is realistic and how do we continue our our, our way of life uh, Unfortunately, I think we we need some kind of shock to the system until until we have that that conversation doesn't really change. It's interesting, really, that uh, that surely uh, those who are keenest on climate change action seem to be slow to recognise that if the arc of autocracy becomes real, so to speak, authoritarian regimes dominating global um, financial, economic, and energy policies are hardly likely to be sympathetic and very far. Uh, you know, reaching in their thinking around climate. Uh, and yet Greens are, you know, telling us, their leader in Canberra is telling us that the ideal defence policy, the gold standard would be New Zealand's 1% of GDP, cut it right back, basically a peacekeeping force. Um, I asked Compass Polling to do some work on Australian attitudes towards training young people because the Ukrainian situation, it struck me that a lot of people are have been partially prepared some quite well prepared, a lot of others are picking up on the run, but it's a bad thing to leave your people without a reasonable number of people throughout your community who understand anything about leadership, about drill, about how to use uh, military equipment, how to organise, how to respond to a disaster. It was very interesting. It found that um, uh, uh, Australians on average support an increase in defence expenditure of 75%. Um, This was Compass polling, and it was quite a big sample. These were not inconsequential as some people immediately say, oh, well, it must have been a small sample. It would have been, it wasn't, it was quality work. They, 65% believe that we actually ought to do something to reinvigorate cadet corps so our young people get an understanding of how to you know, work together if something goes wrong. Uh, very strongly supported by coalition voters, strongly supported by Labor, opposed by the Greens. But here was the most amazing thing of all, 53% said, well, if we were faced with a Ukrainian situation, I would seek to leave Australia. So there's still not a lot of clear thinking going on. Well, no country has the right to remain safe and prosperous without efforts being made to ensure we are safe and prosperous. You know, I, 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 I come to uh, this issue as a migrant. You know, I, I, I came from Malaysia. I know why people come to countries like Australia, uh, because its institutions are worth living for, worth defending. Its way of life is is worth uh, defending. So I come from that perspective. I do get dismayed when I see people, uh, particularly Australians born in Australia, who who really dish on their own country. Um, And not only do they do that, they actually praise the sorts of countries that they themselves would never really ever want to live in, (laughs) right? So um, as a nation, we don't have a right to be prosperous, unified, um, uh, strong. Uh, We have to to do the sorts of things in our everyday lives to make sure that 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 occurs. Um, So, you know, those sorts of uh, 
surveys that you just pointed to, I mean, I think they're useful to uh, publicise because we need to confront the consequences of the way we think about our country and our place in it. Uh, well, amen. Now, can we come back to you with the Hudson Institute who have done a lot of thinking about this, uh, uh, as I'm sure you have for a long time. Um, we've just had a heck of a shock. Uh, it, it now emerges that the Solomon Islands uh, is uh, proposing to, I guess, at the state, as we talk now, for their parliament to ratify an agreement signed up to by their prime minister with China, which is astonishing. It's just an astonishing agreement. It must have been written in Beijing. There's no input from the Solomons. They're worried about us insulting them as a sovereign country. Well, I would say to the prime minister of the Solomons under their parliament, you've been insulted by China. They're not recognising your agency in this. This agreement is something that's all written their way. You know, they're the big guys and they Anyway, leaving that aside, it should, again, be waking us up, even if we're not being woken up by what we're seeing our television sets in the Ukraine. But as I think you've written, first things first, uh, China it has to try and seek uh, dominance in its sort of first uh, row of um, the islands and, and, play, and countries that surround it. Um, they've come a long way, haven't they, while the West has stood back. And I suspect uh, our children may wonder what President Obama was doing when all of those rocks were turned into military bases in the South China Seas. And what we were doing, for that matter. I, I think we were under the illusion um, that China was going to be more like Japan and more like Taiwan. And, you know, if you go back through the documents before Xi Jinping, even way back to Deng Xiaoping, China had no intention of becoming like Taiwan and Japan. Um, as, as I mentioned when the 1990s happened and the Cold War ended for us, it didn't end for China. For them, they were trying to understand, or I should say the Chinese Communist Party. The CCP were trying to understand how do we stop this from occurring, that is pol political liberalisation, while still benefiting from uh, entering into the global economy. And this is really where the Chinese notion of a state-dominated uh, capitalist system came about because they wanted to maintain control. They, the CCP wanted to ensure that it was the, uh, as I mentioned, the dominant expense of opportunity in the region, such that the elites and the futures of the futures of the elites and futures of the parties are tied together. So, so that's the way the CCP viewed the world, but that's not the way we viewed the People's Republic of China. We just thought the more we trade with them, the more we in interact with them, the more students who come over to Western societies the more they will become like us. Uh, so if I could put it in very technical terms, for the last 30 years, we focus on absolute gains. That is, we focus on just gaining from interacting with China without reference to how much China was getting out, getting out, getting out of that. China focus relentlessly on relative gains. That is, what did they get from us and how to make sure that we get less from them because their intention is to eventually be powerful enough um, to uh, supersede not just our material power, but our institutions and norms and so on in, in, and rules in the region. So that, you know, in a sense, China has been playing a very different game. It's only been the last maybe five or six years where, where there's been a widespread understanding of that. And a lot of thanks has to go to Xi Jinping, who I think has quite foolishly revealed to the world what exactly it was he's up to. And it wasn't just him, it was his predecessors. Now, uh, this is where we're at. I, I think you know, almost every sensible commentator now recognises um, that China is not going to be the country that we hoped it would be and that we've got a very big problem in our hands. But that's where we're at right now. Lee Kuan Yew, on 21 years ago, I, I remember reading it, that... Uh... Well, he foresaw nearly all of this happening and said the only answer would be, you know, collegiate activity. Hit one, hit us all, and we're, you know, what have you. Um, it does seem to me that uh, the, the West has made a frightful mistake in not teaching history properly in our universities and schools now for decades. And a big part of that has been that we have assumed that other people are just like us. 
you know, the Russians are not just like us, uh, particularly uh, you know, under the sort of authoritarian regimes that they've experienced. Um, and we haven't understood communism, just as we've not understood the main strands of our own thinking, whether it's democratic socialism, whether it's liberalism, whether it's being conservatism, they're not understood. Uh, they've all broken down. And that's part of the reason, I think, why our country, our people are frustrated. We've drifted into ad hoc managerialism and uh, uh, short-term uh, policy approaches. We don't have anything to assess the day-to-day -day issues against as we think about what sort of society we're arguing for. What's my point? I think that we have kicked endless home goals by failing to understand our history and failing to understand, to put it frankly, I've forgotten who said it, that a communist is a communist is a communist. We have become ahistorical, but worse that we, we pretend that ideology uh, is something that disappeared 20 years ago. Um, so, you know, I remember write, writing about China and I, I didn't, I didn't, um, I didn't sort of begin my, my, um, academic or research career as a sinologist. I, I studied China because I realized there was something quite troubling going on, and that's that's where it started. But I remember even ten years ago when you emphasized the communist element or the Leninist element of the Chinese Communist Party, you were scorned at. You were seen as someone who was just being provocative and obsolete uh, and backward. <laughs> Um, and I remembered even when I would speak about the problem of the Chinese Communist Party, I would be told by very distinguished people that this is insulting to the Chinese nation to isolate the Chinese Communist Party as something worth examining in terms of what they actually believe and what they want to do. So it goes to your point that we started thinking that the Chinese people, all they cared about was getting a bigger house getting a social media account, traveling the world, um, you know, becoming a doctor, becoming an engineer. We forgot that other societies, as you mentioned, there are real ideologies that drive them and that frame the way that they view the world. And yes, there is a difference between the Chinese Communist Party and Chinese people. Um, but part of the problem is that the CCP has been so dominant, not just politically, but socially, educationally, intellectually in the country that it is very difficult to openly think differently now in, in that country. So um, we are only just realizing the sort of challenge that China has become. And, and this is why, in a sense, I take, I, I see China as a far more serious challenge than say Russia, um, not just because I think China will be a lot more powerful than Russia, but because China thinks a lot more about the intellectual and ideological framing of um, the world than does Russia. And China has had some quite a bit of success, I think, particularly in terms of how the world talks and thinks about modern day China today. It's, it's very much a CCP framing. Um, and, you know, we really have to break out of that. You've touched on something there that I wanted to explore with you, and that's that the Chinese people now have heard so much from the Chinese Communist Party, so little from outside, and coupled with it, of course, is this unbelievable surveillance machinery that casts real doubt on the old idea that authoritarian regimes you know, fail because their own people rise up against them. It, it's almost impossible to break out, I would have thought, in China today because you're going to be stopped before you get off to base one, the social credit system, you're born with a number of points if you do the wrong thing. It's all so incredibly surveilled. I'm told there's 400 million closed circuit television cameras in China alone monitoring people, facial recognition, point system being added up. If it, if it goes wrong, you, you won't get the internet speeds you need to do your homework. If, it go, if, you, if you misbehave even more, you won't be, get a job, you won't be allowed to. That sort of control is unheard of and yet I would have thought it would have stifled. Here's the thing. China's become, going back to my earlier point, the thing that one of the things that's picked up from the West is an economic model that's worked well. It's been broadly free enterprise. But this must absolutely stifle innovation and economic growth. I see it's being scaled back a lot because of fears of what uh, uh, Beijing imposed on businesses last year. But uh, 
How do they maintain that increasing wealth if they treat their people in this sort of way and their businesses in, in those sorts of anti-free enterprise ways? Economics well, if, if being it, it, vital to, yeah. econo- to, to military power in the end. Well, if, if, if you look at the, the way China has um, attained wealth up till now, uh, up till very recent years, it's largely been the manufacturing power. And when you're when you become a manufacturing country, you can import that innovation. You know, you can import the know-how. And, and so, if you look at the nineteen nineties and two thousands, most of the manufacture manufacturing capital, um, uh, uh, most of it came from advanced democracies, right? So that's how China imported the know-how. So in a sense, you, you can import that. You can produce things cheaper and better, or, or cheaper at least, and faster than other countries. And that's what China's done. But this is now a real challenge for China that you're getting to. And China can't now rise further just as a manufacturing country because it's run out of markets to manufacture basic goods for. Right? So it has to rise up as an innovation country. Um, it has to create industries in um, the, the, the next areas that will generate value and generate wealth. Uh, and this is actually what the Made in China 2025 stuff is all yeah. about. Now, to your question, how do they do that? Because you require a lot of innovation for that to occur. To put it very bluntly, China either tries to continue import it, that is allowing companies like Tesla to come in and and, um, allow that technology transfer. It's another reason why China um, so systematically relies on intellectual property theft because it has to do that in order to, to get the innovation inputs into its economy. Uh, but the, the challenge still remains to them. You know, how do they actually um, produce genuine domestic uh, sources of innovation that aren't just incremental? And they haven't really been able to do that so far. You know, and, and this is where, where I think that China has often portrayed itself as uh, an innovation autarky that doesn't need the rest of the world. It's it's actually very, uh, it's actually quite the opposite. That that China is still extremely reliant on the West, United States and Europe in particular, to continue its rise. But it's trying to sort of get the things it needs from the West without giving up anything in return. Uh, and so so this is where I think you know we still have quite a fair bit of leverage over China if we actually want to use it. Um, just just on the a, a final point about uh, something you raised about the social credit system, you know that's been very effective because most Chinese people aren't Communist Party um, followers, but because of things like the social credit system, it conditions the way you actually behave. Right, so it's not like they really love Xi Jinping thought, but they have to do what they have to do to get ahead in their society. So they effectively act like good party members even if they're not ideologically uh, devoted to the party. And, and, and that's been a real problem for us. I mean, there's also other things in China like the internet. We thought the internet would be a liberating force for China. The problem is they have the Great Firewall of China where nothing goes in or out without permission of the Chinese Communist Party. But another problem with the idea of the internet being a liberating force for China is that uh, most people in China um, uh, speak and read Mandarin. And most Mandarin content is created inside China, which is regulated and censored by the Chinese Communist Party. So they're not, they're not really, even if they could get access to the New York Times or the Australian newspaper, they don't read that, right? Because they don't read English. So, so these are some further barriers as to why China uh, uh, isn't, hasn't been ex- as exposed to outside ideas as we would have thought uh, when they first integrated with the global economy. Uh, despite the contact they must have had with much of the diaspora around the rest of the world, I mean, there was what, a million and a half Chinese citizens in this country now, I think. Uh, and they're all over the world. Uh, many of them, if they're able to communicate freely with their families back home, must be revealing a very different and, uh, and more um, cheerful, if I can put it that way, environment in which to live. Well, if a, a lot of the Ch- Chinese diasporas that still have contact with um, uh, people inside mainland China, the, their contacts tend to be in the middle classes inside mainland China. And, and the problem with 
the a lot of the attitudes of middle classes inside mainland China, they are the strongest supporters of the Chinese Communist Party. And they right. are because they're the primary beneficiaries of the Chinese Communist Party in the way the political economy is set up. So if you speak to the middle classes in mainland China, they basically parrot CCP messages um, be- because they're the ones that primarily benefit. In fact, it's, it's actually the poorer um, people in China who uh, don't tend to be as strongly supportive of the CCP. So the CCP is now very much an elite society, but they're the, they're the sorts of people that we interact with or pick the diasporas the tend to interact with. Uh, and so they actually tend to be you know, very strong defenders of the CCP uh, system. So you've given us a lot of insights to start to uh, try and pull this together a little. To quote a recent article of yours, you say this, China is playing a longer game. It still needs capital, technology, know-how and access to Western markets to eventually surpass the United States. Does this mean that, uh, that contrary to so much international relations commentary over the past 15 years, that perhaps China's economic rise to supremacy is not inevitable? You know, I've spent a, a, a big part of the last 10 years trying to um, make the case that we, um, the advanced democracies, United States, Australia, we have a lot of agency as to what happens, you know, despite the disparity if that is inevitable that China is going to dominate. Now, even if you look at Chinese blueprints like the Belt and Road Initiative and Made in China 2025, these blueprints were produced by the CCP precisely because they realised how vulnerable they are. You know, even with the Belt and Road Initiative, um, it needs Western Europe to actually work. With Made in China 2025, it needs continued access to the markets of, of the advanced democracies, including America, for Made in China 2025 to, to, to actually happen. Now, China is still, uh, by a long margin, a net importer of technology and know-how of innovation. It has structural problems. Its age demographics in about 20 years are going to be like um, Western Europe's, or in fact, 10 years going to be like Western Europe without the, the social systems, the pension, pension systems, health systems to actually support that. Um, it has a enormous debt problem. It, it's, it has increased its amount of debt in relative and absolute terms by the most of any major economy in, in world economic history. You know, it basically can't grow anymore using the model that, it's, that it has. So for China to succeed, it needs to lull the advanced democracies into a sense of false security uh, in order to disproportionately benefit from um, interactions with us. So what I'm really trying to say is we have a lot of say in what happens to us and also what actually happens to China. And if you want to put it this way, I would rather be Joe Biden than Xi Jinping. Um, I think the Chinese are in a, I don't underestimate them, but the Chinese Communist Party is in a very difficult situation and that it's almost reached the twilight of its most uh, opportunistic years. It's going to get harder from now on. Going back to something you said earlier then, just on that. Uh, you know, the President Xi Jinping is, is, is looking for, a, you know, a historic extra term, yet he's gone out and antagonised everybody by the standards of what you've just said. It's made China's task of kidding the world about its real intentions much, much harder. What does that mean for, for his chances uh, of, of succeeding in his goal of re-election? Well, I... I would expect him to um, probably get a third term, but not because he's been a brilliant strategist. It's because he has still managed to coerce and intimidated all his rivals. I mean, he continued to put uh, his rivals in jail as a failsafe. You know, over the last uh, seven or eight years, he's put uh, more than a million, about a million and a half Chinese Communist Party members in jail. And these, some of them are seriously senior people. I guess the point I'm making is that he is clearly paranoid. Um, The fact that he needs to continue to put rivals in jail tells you that he has a lot of enemies. Um, He has a food tester, you know, he's afraid of being poisoned. 
He hasn't left the country in two years. Some speculate it's because he's afraid of a, a, a coup, If should he do that. Um, I would expect him to get a third term, but the trouble for Xi Jinping is that for him to continue to exercise that sort of power that he does around himself, he needs to continually point at successes, you know, at Trump's around the world and domestically as well. And, and incidentally, this is also why so many people are worried about a war with Taiwan because China's always wanted Taiwan, the mainland's always wanted Taiwan, but Xi's the first leader to really stake his leadership legitimacy domestically on getting Taiwan back for the PRC. Um, so Xi's playing a very dangerous game. If he succeeds, if there's any po foreign policy or domestic failure, then Xi's uh, leadership is in danger, and I would say even his uh, uh, person is in existential danger. So he, he's living a very dangerous, precarious existence. Neil Ferguson commented that in many ways the greatest danger of all now is that having been awoken, having surprisingly pulled together uh, over NATO, American leadership, in some ways as I look at it now, I realise just how clever the Americans have been in signalling ahead what they know is going on in Russia. And that must have China thinking, just how much do they know? It really must. So you've got all of that going on, but um, you've got Germany of all places stepping right up saying, we will get serious, our defence forces are not up to the task, we'll double expenditure and so forth. The, uh, Ferguson's warning is that one of the greatest dangers would be to go back to sleep. If the Chinese were clever, it's, it's obvious that they'd try and lull us back to sleep. They'd create the impression they were backing right off. They'd be kindly. They would start to relent on Australia and all of the other sort of activities they'd taken on. Um, do you think China is able to do that or have they got themselves in a position where it's almost impossible for, us, for them to hide their real intentions? Have we woken up? Uh, uh, and are they smart enough anyway to try and put us back to sleep, I suppose? I, I, I don't think uh, it's possible for them to hide their real intentions, but the question still remains, what will countries do about it? I'm pretty confident um, that the United States, Japan, Australia will continue in direction. Now, how well we do it is now the question, but I'm pretty confident that we'll seek to continue in the direction that we've been going. The, the real question is, are, are countries, particularly in Southeast Asia, you know, when it comes to China, Southeast Asia remains an enormously strategically important uh, uh, sub-region. The Southeast Asian countries, they don't like paying costs, right? They don't like putting themselves at risk, and I understand it because they, they're small and weaker countries, but they don't really like making irreversible decisions. And there will come a time regarding China that will have to do that. So I'm still not yet sure what these sorts, what these countries will do. Um, but I'm pretty confident that the United States and Japan and Australia will continue to move in uh, broadly the right direction. Uh, although, you know, I don't dismiss that different uh, leaders and parties uh, can, can have different speeds with which they move in, in that direction. Um, but no, I don't think you can put the genie back in the bottle. We know what China wants, um, but we still don't know yet what a, a lot of countries will do. And, and remember, despite my, op my optimism in a sense about the effect that the Russian invasion of Ukraine has had, we still have to remember that no lives in terms of um, the allies have been lost. You know, we, we yeah. still don't yet know what our true resolve is until the prospect of lives being lost is, is actually on the table. And that hasn't actually happened yet. So you take NATO, the signs are positive, but NATO hasn't actually lost one single soldier yet. Yeah. Um, you know, Japan, Australia, America regarding China, the signs are very positive. We haven't actually lost one single soldier. So, so that's the sort, sort of world that we'll soon enter into, or at least a conversation. Um, and we need to continue to understand what's at stake here. One final question there. Uh, you talk Japan, Australia uh, and America. You've not mentioned the other men uh, member of the Quad, India. Hard to understand what they're up to at the moment. You can see some reasons why they'd be reluctant to condemn Russia. But I take it we should assume they'd still be very wary of the Chinese. 
Yes, in India and China, there is no possibility of those two countries becoming friends. Um, you know, they obviously have an ongoing border dispute, which has become violent in the small scale um, in, in, in the last couple of years. But if you spend any time in India now, I mean, they clearly see China as a primary and enduring threat. That's not going to change. On an Indian-Russia front, India has to make some decisions as to what kind of country it wants to be. Yes, about 45% of its military equipment still comes from Russia, and Russia or the Soviet Union has been a long-time friend and even ally of the Indians. But the Indians must be realising now that a future of friendship with Russia is not going to be particularly beneficial for the Indians. And no, they're not going to become our ally in the way that the United States is, but if they want to maximise their strategic options, getting closer to Russia is not going to do that for them. So rationally, you would expect the Indians to become more uh, constructive uh, when it comes to issues of China and Russia. But, you know, the Indian system moves very slowly. Um, and I, India is a valuable partner, but I don't expect India to be any kind of genuine ally uh, as, as such. But the Quad is extremely useful organization. I, I would persist with it. John, your insights are incredible. Uh, as I said at the beginning, I just wish every Australian would uh, have as a requirement that they read whatever you print, whatever you say, when you print it, when you, when you say it. Uh, I can't thank you enough for your insights. Oh, look, it's really great that, that I've been on. Thanks for having me. And uh, 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 hopefully I can come on again some other time. Thank you. Did you enjoy this conversation? To keep up to date with new episodes, subscribe to the channel and click the notification bell.